Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everybody, welcome to Uncommon Sense. I'm Junia Doan and I'm thrilled you're tuning in today because I'm interviewing author James Goodman, author of But Where is the Lamb? A wonderful book on Abraham and Isaac. So you're a professor of history at Rutgers University and you also teach in the Master of Fine Arts creative writing class. How do those two go together? Uh, for me they go together uh, half okay and half sort of schizophrenically. Um, when I started in graduate school, uh, I started in a creative writing program. But as I was going through it, I decided that I didn't want to just spend my life teaching writing. I wanted to have a subject to teach. So I asked a couple people and they said, why don't you try history? I had had virtually no history courses uh, properly understood at college. And so I started reading some history books, uh, particularly ancient history and uh, early modern history. And I realized, oh my gosh, these historians are actually also creative writers. Uh, so this would be a good discipline. I went and got a PhD in history. And I've always sort of tacked back and forth between the two. Because great history has always been great writing taking complicated, specialized things and making them accessible to all sorts of different people. I mean, history is the stories. History is the stories that the present tells about the past. And the more imagination goes, that goes into recovering the past, the more accessible and the more engaging those stories are going to be. So I, I do both. I teach my students both about the past, but I also teach them to think about how to tell stories about the past. And that might, those stories might be nonfiction, they might be fiction, it might be poetry, it might be a play, uh, and increasingly it might be a documentary or uh, a, some kind of film or television or a museum exhibit or virtually anything. So in teaching them how to tell a story, what do you teach actually? What do they have to learn? What they have to learn is two different kinds of things. One is to uh, get off their butts and go do some research, to actually get into archives, to interview people, to find out stuff about other times and other places. But then they've gone and they've done all the work, which is what we think of as historians doing, with a sort of, uh, we think of historians as people that sit around in dusty rooms reading old newspapers and people's diaries and letters. And, and that's part of it. Or in interviewing people. I mean, Robert Caro's books uh, are made up of thousands of interviews in addition to his sitting and reading uh, in dusty archives. But then you've got to figure out what your story is and how to tell it. And what I do that not every history teacher does is insist that nonfiction writers need to think about form as much as poets do or fiction writers do. They can't assume that they come back from the archives and simply record what they found because that's not what it's about. What it's about is figuring out what the story is and what the best way to tell it is. And that's what I do in my classes. I say, okay, you have this information. What is going to be the best way to tell it? Is it going to be a, a, a short essay? Is it going to be an article in a scholarly journal? Is it going to be an essay that you might read in the New Yorker or the Atlantic Monthly or Harper's? Or is it going to be a book length uh, study of, of some sort? So that's what I do differently is say that form is just as important in nonfiction as it is in fiction or poetry. You have to find the form. The, so um, are you asking your students to have a story beforehand or just look at the material and come back? Is there a matrix that they can lean on, so to speak, to figure out a story? Sometimes they have a hunch about something right. and they go and they do research 
and come back. And if they're, if they're good, they won't let that hunch completely control the material. But it, may, but it may shape that. It's very exciting when you have a hunch and you go into the archives or you start interviewing people and you say, oh, wow, this is much more complicated than I thought it was going to be. But some stories are meant to be told as stories. Sometimes they have an argument they want to make. Sometimes it's about an argument. Everybody thinks that inner city poverty in Chicago is caused by this. And what they do is find, wow, it's not caused by this at all. You need to understand that to understand it. So sometimes an article becomes an argument. And you see that all the time. In fact, most of what we see on the television, on the internet, on the radio is, is an argument. But a lot of my students end up also telling stories because stories can be more open. Stories can be a way to draw readers in to particular problems, particular moments, particular places that they might not be inclined to go if it's just sort of the facts, the dates, the places, the four causes of the Vietnam War, the three causes of you know, World War II, a lot of kind of stuff that you might have gotten in middle school or high school. Um, do you ask your students to try to edit out their hunch or edit out their viewpoint? Uh, or I ask is them that the wrong way to? It depends on the project, right? right? So my first book is about the Scottsboro case, a yes. rape and race case in the 1930s. Yes. That occupied people's attention for over 10 years and people all over the world were paying attention to. It was a complete travesty of justice. The, the, the nine defendants didn't do it, yes. yet they were sentenced to death for doing it and it was 20 years before they were all exonerated. In fact, it was only this past year that several of them received pardons. I know that they didn't do it, but the way I look at history, what I need to show my readers is how not just that they didn't do it. I certainly want to show my readers that. I wouldn't want any reader putting my book down, which is called Stories of Scottsboro, not the story of Scottsboro. I wouldn't want any reader putting the book down thinking that they did it. But what I really want to do, since most people understand that now, is show my reader how people could have thought they did it where people got their information from, what preconceptions they took to the information. And I encourage my students to do that kind of thing. Any time there's a conflict, there's at least two points of view, and usually many more than two points of view. And I think what part of what historians need to do uh, is help their readers understand it from all the different points of view. Because always there are many points of view that go into understanding something. If you don't understand how the people who got the, the story wrong came to that story, you're n really not understanding the, this, the whole thing. Well, you could carry that over into real life then, uh, even into marriage. I mean, your viewpoint, her viewpoint. Do I you tell, practice this in a marriage? Well, it's so funny. It's a very perceptive question because I tell my students that if they came to my families, especially my extended family, I have three sisters and a brother, Thanksgiving dinner or Passover Seder and listen to me, they wouldn't always see someone who is equally sensitive to everyone's point of view, though I try. It's, I say, when we study the past, we have the luxury of a certain distance. So, okay, 60 years have passed, 100 years have passed, 1,000 years have passed. Let's use that distance to dispassionately look at points of view different from our own. Though I have to say, I do, much to the dismay sometimes of my colleagues uh, at Rutgers and sometimes even my family, it's an instinct of me when I'm arguing with someone or when I'm observing an argument to try to say, hmm, how do they get to that position, you know? And I, and I really do want to understand. Some people say racism is over in, in the United States. I don't happen to think that. But what I like to do is think, what is the experience of a person who thinks that it's over? What is making them say that or think that? Where are they 
you know, having that experience that make them say, is it simple just politics that to say racism is over then allows them to say we can do this, this, that, and not do this, that, and the other thing? Or do they really feel it deep in their hearts? So I'm always inclined to try to figure out um, problems from multiple points of view. But aren't they malleable? Say for myself, mm -hmm. some years ago, <laughs> when I was anguished over something, I said, it's a story you're telling yourself. Same experience, tell another story, and it's over, or it's different. Yeah. And so for myself, in almost any situation, I can tell myself a different story, <laughs> uh, one way or another. Uh, and it seems to me also the people who are coming to things from different points of view, they too, if they change their story internally, they might be saying different things or experiencing or viewing or concluding different things. I agree completely with the way you do it with yourself, but I think that you are a writer, whether you write or not. That's what writers do. They say, wait a minute, I'm not telling this story the right way. And they might get through a whole manuscript and realize it might be told in the first person singular. And they realize, wait a minute, it's the wrong point of view. Or it might be told from one character in the family. It might be told from the wife's point of view when actually, oh, I realize I need to tell this from a child's point of view. I wish more people could do, I do what you do, all the time, not maybe as fast as I would like to, but say, wait a minute, I can reframe this. I can look at this differently. Let me step back a little bit. Let me not be so emotional for, for a minute. Let me see how my son is thinking about the choices that he's making, or the other son is thinking about the choices. Um, let me put myself in his living room with his girlfriend and see how it looks to them. I do that, and you do that. I find that a lot of people just grab a story and they, it's, it's just stuck to them or they're stuck to it. And so I don't feel that certain essential stories, um, in politics in particular, uh, some people don't change them as easily as you and I change them. Hmm. I wish they did. Well, they're not free then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. if you're owned by your story, yeah. Uh, you're, you, yeah. It's narrow. You want yeah. a bigger world. Uh, anyway, yeah. superficially, I, people seem to change them. I mean, public opinion polls—they're just we just we live by them, and we're going to die by them. But it depends on how you ask the question. And so, one day, you know, 60% of the people are in favor of Obamacare, and the next day, you change the question, and it's 40%. Well, obviously, you couldn't have people changing real opinions, or maybe people don't, you know, uh, don't even know what what they're answering yes or no to. Interesting. For myself, uh, at least for me in my life, it seems to me the culture changes about every seven years, eight <laughs> years, in very small ways. Yeah. Just what the emphasis is, or the perceptions are, what considers right or wrong. As a historian, have you noticed anything like that, or am I a alone in my experience here. No, you're definitely not alone in your experience. I mean, I don't know how many years it is exactly, but if you think just in our lifetimes, I bet we're roughly the same age. And if you think how dramatically things have changed, and not necessarily always in one direction or not. I mean, the Supreme Court just last week with, uh, with prayer before the, uh, the town meeting in upstate New York. I mean, I, I said to my friend, my history students, I said, look, history doesn't just move forward. Sometimes uh, it seems to move backwards. Yet, like, but think of gay marriage. I mean, everyone was explaining the election, the presidential elections of 2004 uh, in terms of the Democrats being seen in favor of gay marriage. And now to be against gay marriage is to be seemingly, for now, on the wrong side of history. And that's about a seven-year change. Yeah, <laughs> interesting. When you first were suggested to study history, what, what about you made that a good fit? Um, well, it, the history is full of stories. Yeah, like you said. It is full of conflict. And I'm interested in conflict. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in, in reducing conflict in the world. And history is a place to understand 
the origins of all the different kinds of conflict around us. So if you want to understand why, why our prison populations are what they were, I mean how many times bigger than they were 30 years ago when, when you and I were, were coming of age. Or if you want to understand, I mean the Middle East, you couldn't possibly understand the Middle East, which uh, is just, you know, a sort of amateur interest of mine, without understanding the history of it. So uh, the uh, interest in human beings, in relationships among human beings, in stories, it's just kind of a place to go for all of that. From I've, distance. Yeah, I've never been the facts and dates person. And how is history usually taught or, or written about? Well, you have so little time in school and less and less time than ever before because of the emphasis on practical math skills and basic reading skills and preparing people for technology and all sorts of things like that, that unfortunately it gets taught as a certain kind of rote learning. So, I mean, if I remember it, I don't think it's that different in grade school from learning the three characteristics of populism and the four characteristics of progressivism and the four causes of World War I, which I still remember from ninth grade history, and that kind of thing. And I think it bores most kids to tears. I think that yeah. it all, it's actually, uh, it, to, to, I, I, you know, I went to Hebrew school when I was a kid yeah. and couldn't stand it. We just wanted to get out, out of there. But the things they were teaching us were the least interesting things. Yeah. If they had actually taught us the Bible, oh my God, we would, it's, it's X-rated. I mean, we would I have, know. you know, been carrying it around with us. And in some ways, it's true of history, too, is that we should be teaching the young people the most exciting aspects of it. We should be giving them great stories to think about and to unpack and save the dates uh, and the places yeah. and all that for later. Because the Fill truth in. is, when you're a kid, you can't conceive of time. No. You can't conceive right. of time. Everything that happened it's before over. the first thing that you remember. I, I was born in 1956. Eisenhower is the same to me as Julius Caesar when right. I was growing up. There's, yeah. no, there's no difference. It's before my consciousness. It's only, even when I was writing the Scottsboro book, so I was writing the Scottsboro book in the 80s, uh, mid 80s and, and late, uh, late 80s. The 1930s, so, and I was in my late 20s and early 30s. The 1930s seemed like ancient history to my own life. Now I realized that the 60s and the 30s were like this, like the 90s and now, or the 80s and now. So when Bull Connor is running around Birmingham calling Martin Luther King a communist, and we're sitting up north saying, that's insane, Martin Luther King is not a communist, it's because when Bull Connor was a 21 and 22 year old sheriff in the 1930s, the only people insane enough to go to Alabama and say equality for African Americans were the communists. The, uh, the Part of this book that I really um, <laughs> admired you so much for was the courage <laughs> to step into, I don't even know how you got to the history that you could cite here, <laughs> but the courage and the time required. It seems to me that there was some perhaps either curiosity or dissatisfaction or puzzlement in you that you had to work out mm -hmm. through the research. Uh, yeah. Does that ring a bell? Of course it does. Um, sometimes courage is just another word for stupidity yeah. <laughs> or insanity. Nobody and when, knows how long it takes. <laughs> yeah. When I started this project, um, I got interested in it in the early years, the, 2004 really, uh, of the uh, Iraq war. And I kept hearing people say the word sacrifice. Uh, people who were for the war said, we got to keep going, we need to stay the course or else the people who have died will have sacrificed their lives in vain. And the people who were against the war, this is the time that the uh, insurgency in Iraq is yes. starting, a huge, horrible battle for Fallujah. And Michael Moore, the filmmaker, is walking around Washington, sticking his camera yeah. or microphone in the faces of pro-war congressmen and pundits saying, would you sacrifice your son? to save Fallujah, a town they hadn't even heard of before six months earlier. And so I just started doing what you do when you're a scholar with the luxury of tenure. I started reading about sacrifice and child sacrifice. And of course you stumble 
almost immediately on the story of Abraham and Isaac because it's the ground zero of child sacrifice stories. And I said, oh my goodness, not only is this an amazing story, but it's got a 2,000 year history of people taking a very difficult and troubling 19 lines and remaking it in their own images, which is what I'm always interested about history, people taking it and remaking from the same set of facts or words or sentences or stories, making something new with it. And I said, this is a great subject for a book. Scottsboro is about all different people's yeah. stories in a short moment of time. And my book on the 77 blackout is about all different people's stories in one day. This allowed me to do a 2,000 year span, but had I known when I started, this is the courage and the stupidity, how big a project it was. The kind of giants that little old me were going to have to stand on, I mean, Kant and Kierkegaard yes. and Caravaggio and St. Augustine and all the way back, these people were giants and they wrestled with this story. And I wanted to give readers a sense of the variety and the range over 2,000 years. Well, by the time I realized how insane it was, it was both too late to stop and uh, I was too stubborn I'm to too stop. I'm too fascinated. I'm very, and I was fascinated, but I'm also very stubborn. But there were moments when I just didn't think I was ever going to get there. So it took me, you know, I'd say about 2004, 2005 I started, you know, it took a long time. And it's only a 230, 240 page book. I was, uh, when I learned the story, I thought, what kind of, <laughs> what are they pushing on us? This is yeah. the kind of God there is? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And then two things popped into my mind. Uh, it wasn't so much of a test as it was, <laughs> it was Abraham was a passionate person yes, who took was. things a little higher than they <laughs> needed to be, a little more extreme. And uh, I thought, you know, it just sort of had to play out because he wanted the test, yeah. <laughs> so to speak. The other thing that popped yeah. into my mind um, then a few years later was, where was Sarah? Sarah probably was an intuitive woman who knew her man mm -hmm. and said, God, he's up to something. <laughs> Protect him. Don't let him do anything nuts, right? And then I thought, I can't understand this. I, I don't even know what the well, story is really no, I about. I say you, you are a writer. I don't know if you've, what you've written, but you are a writer because this is what exactly your thoughts are what other people have thought, and they have made stories out of those. So just to give you a couple of examples of them. Um, where is Sarah? Everyone who has read this story. I mean, we ask that question now, and sometimes we put various modern and contemporary and feminist spins on it, but we're not the first people to do it. And that's what's remarkable about it. People wanted to know where Sarah was 2,000 years ago. Because if you start with the beginning of the Abraham cycle in chapter 12 of Genesis, Sarah is everywhere. I mean, she's either been given to another man or she's giving Hagar to Abraham when she feels she can't bear a child. And then she uh, expels Hagar when she gets worried that Hagar is going to preempt Isaac. And, uh, and so she's everywhere. And suddenly, in this climactic moment, she's not there. The Christians are the first people to put her into the story, and they do that in about the 5th or 6th century. Before that, they just assumed she had to be kept out because Abraham would have said to her, oh, Sarah, I'm going off to sacrifice Isaac, and she would have said over my dead body. She'd waited for this kid for 90 years, and she was so protective of him that when his brother teased him, she expelled him off to the desert. The Syriac Christians to connect your two readings, they have her calling Abraham drunk with God. They say, <laughs> just this passionate Abraham that you described, Junior. Uh, they say, you are drunk with God. If he, where are you taking him? They have her saying, where are you taking him? You're drunk with God. If, you're, if God asked you to sacrifice him, you probably would. And they have these incredible hymns where she starts out furious and not wanting him to go. But in the Christian understanding, Mary 
is a type, uh, sorry, Sarah is a type of Mary, just like Abraham is a type of God and Isaac and the Lamb are types of Jesus. So they couldn't disrespect her. They were inclined to just say they had to keep her out of the story because she's a woman and she's going to let her emotions get in the way of her faith. But they couldn't disrespect her like that because they think of her as the prefiguration of the mother of Jesus. So over the course of these hymn the really verse plays over the course of them, she goes from saying, Abraham, you're drunk with God, to saying, if you're going to sacrifice him, I want to come with you and participate. And that is incredible to read. So she actually has this transformation. They make her burning with a desire or a passion to sacrifice her son. And while that is actually appalling to you and appalling to me, in some ways, it's a step forward for her because if that passion and that faith in God is going to be the highest virtue in the society, they're giving her an opportunity to have it too. And that's something that Syriac Christians do as early as the 5th century. So one of the things I learned from the book, as separate that there are a lot of stories, is that it's fluid. Yes. You know, stories are fluid depending on who tells them, who writes them, and almost what they want to hear. Here. Exactly. Uh, I don't really want to say it like that, but, but anyway. Yeah. And so that brings me to my own life, which, as I told you, I try to do that, yeah. which was sort of personally interesting to me and actually taught me a lot. I didn't know that much about history in, in this area. Neither did I. And, uh, but anyway, I really want to thank you for being here, and I have learned a great deal from you. One is to live with enthusiasm, <laughs> live with you. passion, yeah. and to have an open mind and realize that we're part of a great human drama and to bring to everything the sense of uh, curiosity and thoroughness and the ability to see things from many points of view or so how do they get that way. Your idea of understanding history is the way we understand each other, not yeah. well taught of course, either one of them. And so I think that you, the gift you get, I was one of those, so the history over <laughs> You make it possible to understand the human dilemma and the human act of courage and compassion and mess up. And in knowing that, you can do that in your own times, family, friends, Absolutely. and everything. It's a tremendous gift to have. Too many lives are lost, too many <laughs> friends are lost, too many over over a lot of things. So, too but many anyway. People are sacrificed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> And that's another thing. You read sacrifice, and I'm thinking, as a child, what kind of a world was that? Yeah. But then that was sort of common. Then you read about slavery. Oh, my God, what was the U.S. doing? Well, it was really common. <laughs> 2,000 years. Yeah, and then that face, like every century or two, something that was really not so agreeable gets phased out or hopefully phased out. So anyway, you've taught us a lot, and I'm so glad you were here, and I will carry your words with me, and that's the highest compliment I can give you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for having me. <laughs> to contact Junia, send her an email at info at juniadome.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, Go to www.juniadome.com. Thanks for joining us. See you next time for Uncommon Sense with Junior Doan. Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Junior Dow. Join me next on Uncommon Sense. Lust, joy, happiness, intrigue, love, and passion. Right in the Bible? 
Join me as I next interview James Goodman, author of But Where is the Land?